Welcome to Critical Issues Commentary, the podcast ministry of Gospel of Grace Fellowship, a non-denominational Christian church in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. This is Jessica Kramis, your host for today, and I'm speaking with Bob DeWay, Gospel of Grace's teacher and theologian and author of Critical Issues Commentary. Now in this series, we've been discussing um, some false spiritual warfare teachings, and we're also going through CIC issue number 122, uh, the gospel as the true armor of God, deliverance from demons as transfer of dominion. You can find that at the website cicministry.org. Now, last week, you closed with a quote from the article. Why don't we have you share that again, and we'll pick up there. Okay, I'll do that. Um, this is uh, still off the first page of this article, if you print out the PDF of it. And uh, it says this, those in Christ need to stand in the gospel as they preach the gospel and pray for others who do. God commands us to stand, not to retreat to extra biblical information, whatever it might be. Okay. Right. So now, as I reread this here today, and I just preached on this yesterday in church. Now, there's a time lag before this will go out. Okay. So we're kind of here in the middle of January. Yesterday, I preached a sermon, uh, really laying out the armor of God and what it has to do with standing. Right. Because that's the command stand. That was an excellent sermon. If you want to go look it up, you can go to ggf.church. And this would be the sermon from January 24th, 2021. Or you can find it if you go to sermons and then scripture and go to Ephesians, you'll find it there also. Yeah, it would be the helmet uh, of salvation and the sword of the spirit. So I've covered the entire armor. And what I did, I had this idea after I already had the sermon written. So I Decided to do it in the PowerPoint because now I'm about done preaching through Ephesians. It's going on for three years. But when I, in Ephesians 1, there's this thing called Barakah in the Old Testament, which is to bless God. The Greek translation is eulogetos. Okay. And it, it has to do with blessing God for his mighty deeds and glorious promises and his many virtues. And you find that right. well, Paul starts Ephesians, Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, is this one blessing of God, but in it is all that God has done for us as his people. Okay? Okay. So the series of sermons I did when I was in Ephesians 1 all had the word safe in the title. Right. Because Paul is telling us we're safe because the people – in Ephesus, and that's what our series is about now, in Asia Minor, we're afraid of the hostile spiritual powers. And they had magic, they had folk religion, and both Jews and Gentiles had this. Right. We have evidence for that, and we'll show you some of that, and we have been. And so they needed to know, as Christians, that they're safe. We read in Acts, they had already burned their magical uh documents and that burning cost 50,000 pieces of silver worth of money. Wow. And so they gave up an awful lot because when they came to Christ, they realized they were no longer needing to manipulate the world of the spirits to assure their freedom from bad faith. Okay. Okay. So Ephesians starts with you're safe. So, I had a series of sermons, however many there were, maybe six, but they were about being safe. Well, now I've just finished preaching the armor of God several years later from Ephesians 6. And every sermon in that series, other than the one defining what the enemy was about, are all containing the word stand. Okay. okay. And so you book, you have bookends okay you're safe and here's all the what it looks like to be safe seated with him uh you know he he has chosen us and so on everything he's given us inheritance everything he's done for us therefore 
put on the armor and stand. Right. So, now, if we look at that, if we look at Ephesians 1, we're safe because of what God has done and what we have in Christ. Right. It's not about what we're doing and how we're keeping ourselves safe. We are safe because of what he has done. That's, Therefore, we can stand. That's it. Good. Thank you, Jessica. That's exactly it. And that's what I was trying to bring out in that sermon. And this is totally different than popular spiritual warfare teachings that have sold millions of books in the last 25 years. Right. Uh, in fact, you can go back even further than that, but it got really popular in the 70s and 80s, and it continues to be that way. Uh, because they don't understand our status in Christ as revealed in Ephesians chapter one. And they take the armor to be uh, a call to go out and take new territory. Right. And, I, and that's not the point. The point is that Paul has already taught us we're safe. And then in chapter two, he tells us how that happened. We were saved by grace through faith. It was a gift of God. It was not of ourselves. We were dead sinners. God made us alive. And so we need to stand. Well, see, Christians don't like the idea of standing. They think they need to go do something. Right. Tell us what we need to do. Right. We want action. Yeah, but so as soon as you start having any bad symptoms, and I've said over and over again, deliverance is relational, not symptomatic. If you have a relationship with Christ, you are no longer under the hostile powers. Right. And we still live in a fallen world, and we don't have our resurrection bodies, so we still suffer, suffer difficulties like everybody does because we live in this fallen world. But the false teachers are saying, if you got any kind of problem, you got family problems, financial problems, job problems, uh, physical problems, that's evidence that you're under a curse, and maybe a generational curse, and maybe a demon over your city, or maybe some way you're giving ground for Satan to get back and take, take things from you. And so then you need to learn all these secrets to go fight the demons. Right. And I'm showing people as at least the ones that have listened to the sermons on Ephesians, that that's not what Paul's saying. No. We have been transferred out of the dominion of Satan. And later, as we get through this series that we're doing here uh, in CIC, we're going to show you that the Bible says we are God's inheritance. We are. We're, wow. we're, we are the lot or portion that the father gave to the son. Yes. All right? And he's not going to take it away and give it back to Satan. No. And we're not going to lose it because we forgot to go to the deliverance uh, seminar. Right. We're not going to lose our status as God's inheritance which is stated also in that section about being safe, Ephesians 1, 11. We'll cover that later. Uh, and so we are safe because God made us Christ's inheritance, and Christ isn't going to lose his portion. Right. Which is us. Now, there's irony there because the portion was a bunch of dead sinners until God sovereignly made us alive, right? Right. We were, weren't really worth having until he made us who we are in Christ. Amen. So, so then the question is, how do we stand in the gospel? By believing the promises of God. Amen. In some of our previous episodes of this, we mentioned some of the different things that are prescribed. Okay. Okay. And we showed you checklists that people publish. And identifying curses, breaking curses, doing this, that, and the other thing. But that's not what is, we're being told in the Bible. We're told to stand. Because we are already a recipient of God's favor and grace. 
we're already seated with Christ in the heavenlies. That doesn't mean we need to figure out what the demons are doing uh, and somehow direct the demons around. That's, that's not right. It's what we call over-realized eschatology. Both Jude and 2 Peter 2 warn not to do that and call the people who do false teachers. Right. I, I preached on that as well. And so there's a subtle shift. Let me explain this. I didn't get to it in my sermon yesterday. I had notes, but I turned out halfway through the sermon, I realized I had more notes than I had time. So okay. I was going to talk about this. There's a subtle shift. And I, I saw it as I was reading actually some of the better teachers, including this Clinton Arnold, whose material is hugely helpful as far as revealing the practices of ancient Asia Minor and what is being referenced in some of these Bible verses and what kind of a world these Christians lived in and what they had gotten out of and how they were tempted to go back. So Arnold's done great work. But I noticed in his commentary on Ephesians, which I've cited over the last few years of preaching Ephesians, he says something that it's not quite what Paul said, all right? So okay. with all due respect to Dr. Clinton Arnold, who's been so helpful to me, I have to disagree with something. All right. He says what we need to do is appropriate these things. Okay, let's define that a little bit. What does he mean by that? Well, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Okay. Okay, so I actually, um, with my logo software, is able to pull up his commentary in Ephesians and search for the word appropriate. I found a whole page of references. Okay. Appropriate, 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 appropriate the pieces of armor. And, you know, he's rather benign compared to somebody like Neil Anderson, who endorses Arnold, but Anderson goes way further. Okay. And it's Ed Salvoso even further. That's what this article is about. But what about appropriate? It's appropriate. So I decided to do some research. Is that what Paul is teaching or not? Okay. Well, using my search functions with Logo software, I found out the term appropriate as a verb is never used anywhere in the New Testament in any of the English translations I have. All right. So whatever the term, it's not one any translators of the New Testament found in the Greek. Okay. Appropriate as a noun is different. I mean, wear appropriate attire when you come to church or whatever. Right. So if I think of appropriate as a verb, I'm thinking of either we're taking this, you know, the military is going to appropriate weapons for this war, or maybe we're setting aside, Congress is going to appropriate X amount of dollars right. for, for something they're going to do. Right. Or if you have a household budget, and you decide, well, let's appropriate some of that to buy a new toaster. Right. Okay. Yeah. So you kind of have something there, and then you need to decide to assign some of it to this over here. Right. But well, that's so then the armor of God is not something that God's waiting for us to figure out what to do with or how to use it. We don't gain it by appropriating it. It's already uh, what God's provided through the gospel. So here's, here's how I, I finally just analyzed that and looked up all those uses of the term appropriate. But I think the problem is our itch to do something. Yes. In other words, believing just doesn't sound like it's going to do it. Right. Okay. We've got to take some kind of action to solve the problem. And believing and standing in the gospel as this article that we're issue 122 that we're covering, is talking about standing. Right. In fact, that word is used a number of times. And, and Arnold points this out. He gets it right. The beginning of the armor of God, the, the command to stand in the imperative, and there's versions of the Greek word histomy, stand, really controls the entire passage. So okay. stand with your feet shod with the gospel readiness. Stand with the belt of truth. Truth being 
the, uh, the truth of the gospel itself and the person of Christ. Stand with the breastplate of righteousness, which is Christ's imputed righteousness, not our own righteousness. Stand right. with the shield of faith, which is our faith in Christ and what he's done for us. And the sword of the spirit, as I was preaching on yesterday, is the, the sword that comes from the spirit. And it's defined by Paul as the word of God. Right. So when right. we're standing, Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. He cited the word of God in an appropriate fashion so that Satan's lies couldn't penetrate his mind. All right. Okay. Yep. So how is that appropriate? I don't see a connection there. Maybe you could say, recalling to mind the correct scripture that would answer Satan's accusation. Okay. That might be um, valid, but I'm not so sure that's exactly what Clinton Arnold is saying. And certainly well, that's what Neil Anderson is saying. Really, I would say the Holy Spirit does that in us. He calls to mind the right scripture. Right. What we us. do is I spend our whole life studying it. Right. I mentioned that in my sermon yesterday. After years and years and years, it takes a lot less time. When the temptation comes, verses just pop into your mind. Wait a right. second. No, no, no. It comes into your mind. Thou shalt not covet. Yep. Um, when you see somebody's hot car that you wish you had and you can't afford, right? <laughs> yeah. Whatever it is, you, thou shalt not covet. You remember it. You think of it. But that. But what happens with these warfare teachers that, like Neil Anderson, I'm not talking about Arnold now, but Neil Anderson, they take appropriate, and he uses it too, to mean let's let's devise this process that we can do. Okay. And then you come up with the checklist, and we showed you that. Box after box after box, where you evaluate your past, try to process your past. Where is the curse coming from? What's the inroad the demon is getting? And then you have this whole series of affirmations and uh, denials or renunciations. I renounce, then I affirm. I renounce, I affirm. I renounce. And you go down this list provided by Neil Anderson. And because people feel good if they're doing something, they think it might work, it might help. But they're suddenly heading back toward a pagan worldview. Right. And... Because that's what these magical texts were that were burned in acts that were worth 50,000 pieces of silver. They were ways of manipulating the spirit world to ward off bad faith. Right. What so we, we really need to do is put down Neil Anderson's list and pick up the word of God. Right. So standing is believing what God said and what God has done. It's not taking some further action that we're not even sure what it is. Right. Standing is believing God's promise and re rejecting in our minds the very lie of Satan. Right. The accuser never stops accusing us. They overcame him, according to Revelation, with the blood of the lamb. Well, the blood of the lamb was shed once for all. But even that, okay, I've been around a long time. I've been a Christian since 1971. And I remember many times people pleading the blood over things. Right. Guys, I'm sure any dumb idea is still out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so, and people would interact directly with spirits and they, and, and spirits will manifest through people. Well, they're uh, more than happy to put on a show for you. Right. And that's what happens. That's what happened with the sons of Skiva. Right. Well, there were people that would just see whatever caused the greatest reaction and then go with that. Okay. And one person told me a story of what he had gone to a deliverance counselor and, and they started saying, uh, we plead the blood, the blood, the blood. And then the, the, the demonic response was, oh, no, not the blood, not the blood, anything but the blood. And they thought, mm -hmm. oh, this is working. Open your eyes. And the guy would close their eyes. So they peel them open and hold them. The blood, the blood, the blood. And the person's like crawling out of their skin. Yeah. Or and 
they thought they were doing good because they were getting more reactions. Right. But the, the, re the reactions are just. Oh, go ahead. The, well, the reactions are powerless to save the person and transfer them from that domain. Right. See, here's, let's just go to that. That's one example I remember okay. from the 70s. Okay. Here's the real issue. Are you in the domain of Christ or are you under the domain of Satan? That's either or. Yeah. There's no gray area there. Mm -hmm. We made that clear over and over. Uh, you can look at Acts 26, 18, Colossians 1, 13 and 14. Just preached on that one again yesterday. Now, if you're in a domain of Satan, all these manifestations won't do any more good than what the sons of Sceva found out when they got beat up by the guy who was demonized. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you can be under the domain of Satan and never have a demonic, demonic manifestation and not even believe there is a Satan. If we just look around at the unbelieving world around us, look at our neighbors. I have some really wonderful, delightful, unbelieving neighbors. Right. They have zero demonic manifestations, yet they're in the domain of darkness because right. they're unsaved. Right. That's what we need to know. We need to know the big picture of the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. Right. But we are of God. We're under Christ. It's not geographical. It's not symptomatic. It's relational. Yes. I explained that in my sermon yesterday. You can't stake out some geographical territory, get all the unbelievers out of it, claim it for God, and see if we sit in this little area here, the demons can't get us. Right. It's not geographical. The whole no. world, however you want to look at it, is influenced by the fall. Yep. Okay? We're not in the Garden of Eden. Now, the, that illustration of those people pleading the blood and yelling the blood at the demons, they were allowing the demons to, to tell them how to deal with the demons. Exactly. Because they're putting on a show. And, yeah, and it, it is just, it's giving believability to the deliverance ministers people see the reaction they see the manifestation and they think oh now the demons are on the run it's good, it's good. no listeners this is very important let's just use that one as an illustration when it says in revelation 12 they overcame the accuser through the blood of the lamb it's talking about the blood of christ that was shed once for all on calvary right not some metaphysical entity floating around the universe yes not an incantation which is essentially what they were using there as an incantation a magical word that scares the demons right it's the once for all shed blood of christ what's that have to do with deliverance from satan it is the ground by which we have forgiveness of sins as we put our faith in Christ, the one who shed his blood and was raised on the third day. God, the Son, the second person of the Trinity, who sits at the right hand of the Father, according to Psalm 110, verse 1, cited throughout the New Testament. And so we overcome by believing, dear ones. We believe. We believe. My sins are washed away so Satan can accuse all he wants. But I'm not standing on my own righteousness. I'm standing on the promises of God in Christ, whose blood has washed away my sins forever. Amen. Did you see the difference? Yes. The one approach, believing, is standing on what God has done, which is what okay. he is teaching. The other, call it what you will, I don't know if that would be appropriating, but it's taking something that we should believe and trust and stand firm in into some process that we think is going to defeat the demons. Right. So I'll go back to the statement I just I read to begin this segment. God commands us to stand, not to retreat to extra biblical information. 
Right. So what demon is here or there? What curse may be applied to this person, and not the other person? Where the bad fate is coming from? What religious process we can invoke? And now, I should say this at this point. I'm talking about things that were going on in the 70s and 80s. I'm sure they still do. But the most popular one now isn't that at all. It's integrating Buddhist and Hindu and Eastern meditative processes in order to find the peace and joy of the world of the spirits. Right. And so they go through this enneagram or something else and go through meditative processes in order to silence the mind. Now, we dealt with that when we did that series on Kundalini Yoga. Right. With someone who had gotten out of it. But uh, we just got something from somebody that we know who doesn't really know Christ, who was uh, saying, well, there's a serious situation, so we need to. And then it was basically a pagan version of trying to find peace or get the spirits of everybody together in one agreement. The yeah. good vibes are going to come in. I don't we're, know. We're all going to send positive energy. Yeah. In other words, tap into the positive energy field. Mm -hmm. It's a different thing. It doesn't seem quite so a raucous as holding somebody down and pleading the blood over them. Right. But it's <laughs> nice and peaceful and calm, but it's not from God. Right. There's still no gospel in that. There, There is no repentance and belief for the forgiveness of sins. Yeah, you're still under the wrath of God. Yes. You're going to have all these warm, calm, peaceful thoughts. But if you have an escape from the justice of God, it's of no value. Right. I, I, I continue in my article here. It's important to remember that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus to remind them that God had rescued them from the power of of the prince of darkness. Right. Rescue is God taking us out of some bondage. Rescue, and that word goes back to Exodus 6, where God rescued Israel from Egypt. Okay. He brought them out. Yeah. In order to bring them to himself and make them a kingdom of priests and so on. That is cited in Colossians and elsewhere to remind Christians of, of where they came from and who they are now. And so we were rescued from this whole world of the spirits and the shamans and the religious practices and the meditative practices and the bad karma, they call it, and all of these things that went on and on and on for people with no certain hope that you're really ever totally free. Wow. Do the work, do the work, do the work. The, the Bible uses this term rescued, rule my. We're rescued. Okay. So dear saints, if you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, he rescued you. Yes. You, you didn't work your way out from under all the demons and Satan. He rescued you. He brought you out. He brought you to himself. He took you as his child, and he seated you with him where you're safe. And now he's saying to you, stand. Right. Don't go back. When things get tough, when you have problems, you have the throne of grace. You can go directly to Christ. Don't bail out and think, well, maybe I better go find somebody to break the curse over me. Right. Right. That's retreating to shamanism. Well, and he also, he didn't rescue us from the domain of darkness so he could give us some armor and send us back to the domain of darkness to fight the demons. That's what people think. Yes. But and so think that, that that would be like having the Israelites cross the Red Sea so they could get a better chariot to go back to Egypt and defeat the Egyptians. No, he moved them out. He took, he them, took out them out of Egypt. Yeah, he says, I brought you on eagle's wings to myself. Right. 
So we need to not be tempted to go back and fight powers of darkness in the domain of darkness that God saved us out of. Exactly. And I'm very alarmed that people that are well-meaning and they really do want to please God and serve Christ, but they get bombarded by these teachings and they start being alarmed and are thinking, well, I missed something. Yeah. And I have problems and I, I better go try this or try that. And God is saying to stand, you're seated with Christ in the heavenly places, Ephesians 2, 6, because of what he did. Yeah. And what we'll be looking for as we go forward through this series, as I'll show you from scripture, that as a Christian, you're safe because you are God's inheritance that he gave to his son Christ and he's not going to lose you right you could be like the Israelites and build a golden calf say I don't believe Yahweh up here on Sinai or Moses talking I think we'll make our own God well that's apostasy right okay we're strictly against that (laughs) yes so don't apostatize but stand firm in Christ, and you are safe, and you'll stay safe, and you will, in the end, have eternal life. Amen. We are out of time for this edition of Critical Issues Commentary. You can access this program and many others, as well as years worth of articles at the website, cicministry.org. And we want to remind you to stand firm in one spirit with one mind and strive together for the faith of the gospel. For Critical Issues Commentary, this is Jessica Kramis. Bob DeWay. And we'll see you next week.